Thank you. So thankful to the Lord for these folks who lead us in, in worship and music this morning. Our printer wasn't working, so they were, they're just so good. I give thanks to the Lord for them and how they're using their God-given abilities and talents and gifts for Him. All right, take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter and we will look at verses 12 through 22 this morning, and actually verse 12 I touched on last week, and I will simply make reference to it this morning, and we'll really look at verses 13 to 22. But before we dive in, bow with me again, and let's pray. Father, help us now as we have our Bibles open again to give attention to the reading of Scripture. I pray, Lord, that you will use me and pointing people, and myself included, to Jesus. Because if we walk away from a sermon, and we have not been led closer to the Lord, then really it was nothing more than a pep talk. I pray that we will stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, who came into the world as a human being, and showed that He is God. He has authority because He is God. Get glory and honor for your name now, I pray. Amen. Jesus, the temple, and the gospel. Have you ever experienced something wherein what was happening in the moment didn't seem as significant as it should have, but later on it dawns on you, wow, that was a huge moment. I remember hearing an athlete say one time how he was going out thinking, here's another game, a game I've played all of my life, a game that I work very hard to excel at. Little did I realize that because of a career-ending injury, that was the last time that I would meet with my teammates in the locker room and have that pregame moment and then run out onto the field with the crowds cheering and, and then play the game and then all of a sudden, in an instant, it's... It's over, and in that moment, I didn't know it. It was a big moment. Sometimes those things happen, where you just look back and you, it hits you. That was a lot more significant than I realized at the time. Well, today we witnessed such an event where Jesus of Nazareth will do something incredible, but His disciples, in that moment, do not grasp it. But later, as John the Apostle will tell us, they got it. I remind you that verse 12 of John 2 is a verse, it's a sandwiched verse, between the event of the wedding in Cana that we just read about where Jesus turned real water into real wine. And remember I told you that if you come to that text looking at it as a reason to be able to drink or as a reason not to be able to drink, you missed the whole point. The whole point was, how can you turn water into wine or anything for that matter? Because I'm God. That's the point of John 2 verses 1 through 11. But now we're getting ready to shift to another event, Passover. And that's a big deal. So verse 12 tells us that after that wedding in Cana, he goes down to Capernaum. That becomes his home base. His mother and his brothers are with him, and his disciples are with him, and they stay there for a few days. That's verse 12. But then John will shift, talking about the trip to Jerusalem and the arrival there for this Passover. The other two Passovers that are mentioned in the Gospel of John are in chapter 6 and then chapter 11, and that goes through chapter 20. By the way, a, a quick summation of John, I may have given you this weeks ago when we began, but in essence, chapter 1, those first 18 verses, are, they're called prologue, it's, it's kind of an overview, and then you have the, the witness and testimony of John the Baptist, and we see that that's largely come to an end, and then in chapter 2, we begin to see the public ministry of Jesus, and that will go through chapter 12 to where that, that's about, or up to chapter 11 is about a three year time period. And then chapter 12 and then 13, 14, 15, and 16, and 17, that's one night. 18 and 19 we're talking about crucifixion. Chapter 20 we're talking about resurrection. And then chapter 21 talking about that 40 day period of time between His resurrection and His ascension. That's the layout of the book of John. 
Why am I pointing out that we have these two other instances of Passover? Because this is one of the ways that we find out the age of Jesus, at least approximately. It's Luke who tells us that he's about 30 years old when he begins his public ministry. And then we have the three Passovers, and Passover occurred one time a year. So that's where we, we understand. And some will argue that there might be one more allusion to Passover in John chapter 5. I'm not convinced of that, but it's really not that big of a debate. There is debate, however, on the temple cleansings. And yes, I said cleansings. I'm one who thinks there are two. See, in Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19, we read about Jesus going into Jerusalem and cleansing the temple, putting out the money changers, telling them that my Father's house is to be a house of prayer. But the issue there, and remember Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels, not Gnostic, synoptic. They're very similar. They have this temple cleansing at the end of His ministry. John is putting it at the beginning. So some have said, well, John is taking that temple cleansing from the end and just putting it here. But that doesn't fit. And you say, well, surely there couldn't be two temple cleansings. Why? I mean, it's not like one time settled the matter and they got it. And by the way, I'm, I'm jumping off the tracks a little bit here, but you're familiar with when the lady uh, washes Jesus' feet with her tears? I think that happens twice too, because Luke tells us that one of those instances is in the middle of his ministry up in Galilee, where the other is actually near Jerusalem toward the end of his ministry, and the end of his life. So the fact that something can happen twice is not that far-fetched. It's not far-fetched at all, actually. So I don't see a debate here. Uh, Jesus is going to go into the temple and put people out who are treating it irreverently. And I don't think that John is in conflict with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I think there are simply two temple cleansings. Now with those introductory notes, I hope you're ready to dive in. The way I'm going to break this down, I've, I've titled it Jesus, the Temple, and the Gospel. And then the subtitle is Showdown at Jerusalem. Showdown at Jerusalem. I'm semi-borrowing that from a sermon I heard at Concord Baptist when Brother David King was preaching through Acts, and it was showdown at, I forget exactly where the showdown was, but I went, hey, it, it's, it's not like we've never heard showdown at, at such and such place. And this is definitely, and we're going to look at verse 13, verses 14 to 20, and then 21 and 22. Those are your three sections. The first section in this showdown at Jerusalem is from verse 13. And this is Jesus honoring the law. Yes, in reference to the Mosaic law. But who is really the giver of the law? It's not Moses. Moses is the one who, who communicates it to the people. But who's the lawgiver? God. And who is Jesus? God. <laughs> He's obviously going to honor the law. So look at verse 13. <coughs> The Passover, Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This is not a geographical problem because Jerusalem sits up in elevation. That's why you can actually be traveling south, but say you're going up. It just means you're going up in elevation. But let's consider the Passover for a moment. Jesus participated in the Passover. Where did it come from? Well, Exodus chapter 12. If you remember, the Israelites are in the land of Egypt for over 400 years, and they are oppressed. And God told Abraham that that's what would happen way before it actually happened. But then God would so move to make the people cry out to Him, and then would hear their cries. So He raises up Moses, who's been shepherding sheep for 40 years, in the desert, and he says, Now you're going to shepherd my people for 40 years in the desert. But here's what is going to happen Pharaoh is not going to let you just go. But you're going to go to Pharaoh and say, Let my people go that we may worship Yahweh. And he won't do it. I will show him by a strong hand who I am. Remember last week, if you were able to be with us, miracles are not ordinary, and you and I cannot perform them. They, a miracle is when God does what only God can do. And they're not ordinary. They're actually very rare. 
Uh, and sometimes miracles are not enjoyed by everyone. The plagues of Egypt were God's miraculous works, but the Egyptians did not enjoy those miracles. Well, that final plague of the ten that God would use to bring about what is called the Exodus was when He will take the firstborn. That's the firstborn human and the firstborn of the cattle. And He says to Moses, but here's that judgment. There's a lamb you're going to take into your home. And you're going to have that lamb there for four days. And then on that last night, you're going to kill it. And you're going to eat that lamb, but you're going to take its blood and you're going to put it on the doorpost and on the lintel. And I remember hearing someone say, if you drew lines where the, where the blood went, one would go side to side and one would go top to bottom where the blood would drip. Kind of a picture of a cross, really. I think that's symbolic for the cross. But, but where I see the blood of the lamb rightly applied, God says, I will pass over that home and spare them from the judgment, the death of the firstborn. But where I do not see the Lamb's blood applied, judgment is coming. And not just physical death, but eternal. You'll be alive, but you'll be under the wrath of Yahweh forever. That's all the way back in Exodus chapter 11 and 12. In Exodus chapter 23, this is a little while after the Mosaic Law has been written down on the tablets and, and given to the people. We find that the Lord commands His people to come, uh, or when they enter into the land to the place He will show them, that they will go to this one central location three times a year for what are called three pilgrimage feasts. You have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is tied to Passover. Then you have the Feast of Weeks. And that's interesting because that's Pentecost. You, you might remember that Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. And then you have the Feast of the Harvest, the ingathering later in the year when they have the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. But he says, you're required to make these pilgrimage feasts and the males are required to show up and present themselves. Well, Jesus is the one who has written the law, so he's obviously going to obey the law. He, requ he is required by law to go to Jerusalem and, and do this as a man, so he does. And you might remember that in the Sermon on the Mount, which comes from Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to do what? To fulfill them. I am the fulfillment of the law. The law cannot save you. It can expose your sin in you and make you feel ruined because that's what the law does. You can't keep the law and be okay with God. You can't. No one can. Paul makes that very clear. So we need a lawgiver and a law keeper. Jesus is the only one who is both. The sinless one who can keep the law. And he says, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Paul in Romans says that the law is still good. Now wait a second. Paul says in Galatians that the law was not given to save, but in Romans, which was written later, he says that the law is still good. It is. Oh, you mean for Jews? No, for everyone. How is that? Because in, in Galatians 3, Paul is talking to Gentiles about why the law was given. To expose sin in sinners. And then when they realize their complete powerlessness to, to do anything about their spiritual condition, the law says, but there is one who has kept me, and it's Jesus. Trust Him. So the law is actually very good if you use it lawfully. Paul says that to Timothy. Because you can misuse the law. How is that done today? There are people who teach that you must believe Jesus and keep the law, and that's what gets you saved. Friend, then that would mean that His work is not sufficient, and it requires yours on top of His. I've got news for you. If that's the way it is, nobody's going to heaven. But at the same time, it is not a legitimate thing to say, well, the law can't save, so let's ignore it. Jesus didn't ignore it. Neither shall we. The law is good. I remember years ago, and I, I don't know if I've shared this story. We're only a few weeks in, but my, my stories kind of get told repeatedly. April, she says that. She goes, you're kind of repetitious. And I went, thank you. She goes, I didn't mean it as a compliment. Um, 
but we had two little dogs, my sister did, Oscar and Lulu. Oscar was part Labrador, part Basset Hound. He was fully black, but about this tall, and he had this boo kind of a uh, bar. He was awesome. But Oscar thought he ruled the roost, and he was inside a fence, and he desperately wanted to get outside of that fence, and one day he did, and then a neighborhood dog came charging, and this dog was not small, and he wasn't coming to play. So Oscar took his fat little body and got back into that fence, and I remember saying, big boy, you wanted so bad to be outside of the boundaries of that fence, that the fence is actually pretty good, isn't it? That kept that dog from eating you. <laughs> the law is good. It's good boundary. Now, you can't keep it to be righteous with God, but it is good, and it exposes not only your sin, but the glory and majesty of Christ. Jesus was a law keeper. So, understand that we do not snub the law, but we do realize that it is Christ and Him alone, by His keeping of the law, that we are saved. Look at verses 14 to 20. This will be point number two. In the temple, he, that's Jesus, found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple. That's Ekbalo. He expelled them with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it is written, and this is from Psalm 69, verse 9, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Or by what authority are you doing what you're doing? Verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? Jesus claims to be the greater temple. I have friends who their end time view differs from mine. Uh, they think that a temple has to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. I don't hold to that view. Could it be rebuilt? Well, it could. I don't think it has to be. Some do, and well, some don't. And that probably just gave you a little bit of an indication that, no, I'm not a dispensationalist. Uh, but some of the men I love dearly are, and I respect them immensely. We simply differ over the timing of the end time events. My pastor, my mentor that I grew up with was a dispensationalist, and he knew that I wasn't, and we got along swimmingly. So, and you're saying, well, I like his view. Well, that's okay. <laughs> but I came to mind through my own study, and I hope you will, you will study accordingly. But Jesus claims to be the greater temple. He makes a right judgment and acts on it accordingly. Now let's, let's think about the temple and what it meant to the Jews. It was to be a centerpiece in the lives of God's people. It started or originated as a tent in the middle of a desert. When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, yeah, we're going back to that. He said to Moses, I will plunder the Egyptians. I will do it. You, you won't do it. I will do it. So as the Israelites are leading after that final plague where the Egyptians and everyone else is telling Pharaoh, let them go, man. Let them, get them out of here. As they are leaving Egypt, the Egyptians are, are throwing their gold and their silver and their fine things at them. God plundered the Egyptians. And that was immense wealth. But there was a reason why God was doing that. Because a lot of this gold and silver and these materials are going to be used to construct something out in the middle of the desert. And it was called the Tent of Meeting or the Tabernacle. That was the first one. Centuries later, King David wanted to build a temple of actual stone and, and, and materials like that. And God would not allow him to. Because he says, your reputation is that of being a man of bloodshed. But your son will build a temple for me. So King Solomon, a son of David, 
does have the temple constructed, and it is magnificent. I mean, it is a thing to behold. But then, in 586, King Nebuchadnezzar, you might remember him there in the time of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar for 25 years laid siege to Jerusalem, waiting for 25 years outside of the walls, but finally goes in and takes Jerusalem as God said He would allow him to do, and burns the temple to the ground. That's 2 Kings 25.9. The temple is destroyed. The people of Judah are taken into exile in Babylon. And God said that's going to happen to the prophet Jeremiah. For 70 years they're going to be in exile. But I will bring them home. And God brings them home. And if you're familiar with the book of Haggai, the book of Ezra, and the book of Nehemiah, especially in Ezra and Haggai, we're told that they began to build the temple, but then they got discouraged by their enemies and they stopped for 16 years. But in 520 B.C., the prophet Haggai goes in and preaches a very simple sermon. Consider your ways. And the people of God were broken and began to rebuild the temple. And they did rebuild it. But it was not as splendid as the one Solomon built. And there were some who were there. Ezra tells us this. That when they saw it, they remembered the former temple. And they wept because it just wasn't that much. And God says to them, don't worry because it's not about a building. Though that other one looked prettier, my glory will be greater in this one. And that's what we should want, folks. Would I like a, a more permanent place than the building that we're renting? Of course I would. But until God moves us, we're going to worship Him right here. It's not fancy, but you know what? It's not cold either. Now some of you are saying, well, Daryl, it is. You should get some insulation. No, don't. Uh, but we've got light, we've got electricity, we've got what we need. And more than anything than having beautiful chandeliers and artwork, you know what? There are some beautiful old church buildings today that are nothing more than museums. Where the gospel was once booming forth, now it's not even said, and they're nothing more than relics and museums. I pray that God will fill this place, and even if it doesn't look like much, the glory of the Lord will be undeniable. That's what we need. So the temple, it's a big deal. Centerpiece of life and worship. But it had been destroyed, then rebuilt. That temple in 520 was rebuilt, not as splendid. Now we're going to see from that 46 year number that the Jews give us that Herod did some upgrading. So, so we do see a little bit of work done to it. But during those pilgrimage feasts, sacrifices were to be offered. And John does not give us detail here as to what particular corruption was going on. He doesn't say whether they were extorting the people or not. The point is this, you should not be doing business here. This place is dedicated and consecrated, and you are treating what is holy as profane. Think about, again, when the people of Judah were taken into the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Do you know why that happened? Well, not only is there one day a week that God set aside for rest called the Sabbath, but in the Old Testament you also read that every seventh year was a Sabbath year where you would let the land rest. But you were saying, well, then how will we eat? God will provide for you. Just like He did with the manna, for six days He provided, or for five days He provided this much, but on day six He gave a double allotment. Well, He will do the same thing for your produce, but you have to let the, the land rest on that seventh year. Well, some people said, no, let's not do that, man. We're missing out on food and money. But God says to do it. Yeah, but we're going to do it our way. And God finally says, okay. For 70 periods of time, I'll let you do that. Now I'm calling your debt. You're going to go to Babylon and be captives for 70 years. You will honor me as Yahweh. Folks, if we treat what God has consecrated profanely, we need not expect to get away with it. And I'm glad we won't get away with it. Treat the holy as holy. Jesus is doing that. He comes in and He finds that the temple is and He's angry. And people say, yeah, He gets angry. But I want you to know why He gets angry. He gets angry because His Father is not receiving the proper worship. See, if I get angry, it's because Daryl's not getting the proper honor. Yeah, but that's self-centered. 
See, when you get angry, you need to ask yourself this question. Am I angry because God is being offended or because I am being offended? And guess which one is going to win? Jesus, when he gets angry, it's always because my father is not being honored. I cannot tell you in truth that every time I get angry, it's because the father is not being honored. It's usually because Daryl didn't get his way. And folks, that's sin on my part. Jesus was angry and did not sin. We can be angry and not sin, but we better be very careful. Sometimes we feel so justified. Well, they did this to me, so I will not forgive them. Okay, look into the eyes of Jesus and tell me what he has done to you. Well, nothing. Okay, what have you done to him? Oh, I've sinned greatly. And what has his response to you been? He has shown me grace and mercy and he has forgiven me. Okay, why now do you think you can look to God and say, I will not forgive this person? I got news for you. God will never say, yeah, that's okay. If you're not forgiven, don't expect to be forgiven. Jesus is cleansing the temple. He drives them out, the sellers and the money changers. That's a reference, or there's a reference here to Psalm 69. Zeal for your house will consume me. Psalm 69 was written by King David, and he's writing that psalm in a period of distress because his, his enemies have surrounded him. He's being punished, he, or he's not being punished, but he's being uh, tormented. Part of the reason is because he loves Yahweh so much, and he loves to be in the temple. He loves to be where, where God is honored, and his enemies are mocking him for it. Well, that wasn't primarily about King David. That passage in Psalm 69.9 was messianic. The 69th Psalm is a messianic psalm, and it is quoted several times in the New Testament in reference to Jesus. And the Jews saw Psalm, 60, saw psalm 69 as pointing to Messiah. So in that moment, they do not think about it, but later on, they remember that Jesus was consumed with zeal for his father's house. The Jews who were in authority, and probably were profiting in some way, wanted to know how Jesus was allowed to do this. What makes you think that you can come in here and disrupt business like that? It's Passover, man. There are hundreds of thousands of Jews here, and there is a lot of business to be done. By what authority do you come in here and kick all of these people out? You might remember that in John chapter 1 verse 25, the Jews sent a delegation to John the Baptist to say, by what authority, if you're not the Christ or the prophet or Elijah, what, by what authority do you baptize? Well, now the question is being asked of Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus says, I'll tell you, what sign, what authority? Um, <coughs> Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. <laughs> and they thought, are, are you kidding us? Destroy the temple, and in three days you'll raise it up. Huh. Um, this thing has taken us 46 years to get into place, to get, to get right. They missed the whole point. And these are religious Jews. See, but that's, that's one of the problems with being religious. If you're not careful, you will be more about your religion than looking to the God who made you. Now, I'm not going to ask that question that I used to ask, or, or the, make the statement that I used to make, but I no longer make. It's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. Actually, it is about a religion. Look at James chapter 1. Pure and undefiled religion is this. But, but this is not about buildings and gold. This is about the God who made us. And Jesus isn't talking about stones and gold. He's talking about his own body, and we'll get to that in point three. But he goes, you destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. There's an interesting phrase there, in three days I will raise it up. Seems like a bit of a conundrum for those of you who might be getting where I'm going. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Jesus is fully God, but fully man. As a man, he died. As God, he did not die. So, in the New Testament, I'm going to give you three different references. There are more. But in Acts chapter 2, verse 24, the Apostle Peter is preaching, and you know who he says raised Jesus from the dead? God speaking. 
Uh-oh. So God the Father raised him? Yeah. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, the Apostle Paul says it was God the Holy Spirit who raised him. Uh-oh. Is Paul and Peter contradicting one another, and are they contradicting Jesus? Because here in John 2.19, Jesus says, I will raise the temple up. So who raised Jesus from the dead? God. And I love the triune nature of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all at work in raising Him from the dead. There's not a contradiction. There's not a problem. There's a consistency within the Trinity. <coughs> Jesus is in fact claiming to be the greater temple. The temple was also destroyed again in AD 70, if you know your history. And on the Temple Mount today is not a temple, it's a mosque. If you've seen pictures of Jerusalem, you've seen that building there with that shiny gold top. It's a mosque. You know who worships in a mosque? Muslims. You know who are not Christians? Well, there's plenty, but Muslims. The place where the temple stood now stands a mosque. Thank God that there's a greater temple. Not built with stone and wood and gold and silver. I'll come back to that, but let me, let me give you this application point. This is to my family in Christ. Emulate Jesus in His love for His Father first and for the things that His Father declares as sacred, set apart. Be careful how you and be careful how we use things that are supposed to be consecrated unto God. Look, the fact is, is this is a building made with some metal and some wood, some carpet and some tile. And there's nothing necessarily holy about those things. But today this stands as a place where a church gathers. This is not the church. The building is not the church. That's why you'll see if I ever message you, hey, I'm going to go to the building. <laughs> and by the way, if you call it the church, that's fine, because we know in common use of language, that's what people mean. But the church is the people, the body of believers in the congregation. That's the church. This is a building. But even though it's just a building... For right now it has been set aside to be a place where the believers gather to worship and praise the Lord. We need to be careful what we do in here. Do we need to be setting up bingo raffles and whatnot? No, we don't. Well, we need to raise funds. Well, that's not how you do it. Be careful how we treat that which God deems as sacred. And may that come from a heart motive that sees Jesus' great love for the Father and the things that are sacred. Third and finally, in this, excuse me, in this showdown at Jerusalem from verses 21 and 22, Jesus used this physical temple cleansing to point to His death and resurrection. Look at verses 21 and 22. But He, Jesus, was speaking about the temple of His body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Consider the temporalness of the present temple and how it gives way to Jesus. When Jesus said, destroy this temple, he's not talking about the building, he's talking about his own body. This is him talking about his death. And by the way, who was responsible for the death of Jesus? And I know there's more than one answer here. The Romans, yes. But who also? The unbelieving Jews. And ultimately, who also? God. The gospel was never plan B. The gospel was the plan before man was ever on the earth. Peter talks about that in a sermon in Acts 2 about how this was the predetermined plan. Predetermined when? Before the world was ever made. You mean God knew that Satan would fall and God knew that Adam would sin? Yes! These things never took him by surprise. But the physical building which started as a tent, then as a building, then as a rebuilt building, was always meant to be temporary. 
In Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews is a great letter about the greatness of Jesus in comparison to other things. In Jesus, uh, in Hebrews 9, we see that there's a temple not made with human hands. And the architect and the builder is God. In Revelation 21, verse 22, we find that the temple in the New Jerusalem is not a building, but rather it is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb who are the temple. Jesus is the greater and final temple, folks. The temple was given, but was always intended to be temporary. Just like the sacrificial system in the Old Testament was given, but always intended to be temporary. The sacrifices in the Old Testament were pointing to a, an ultimate sacrifice. In Jesus in Hebrews, we read that He did not shed the blood of bulls and goats, but His own blood. And that old system is done away and fulfilled in Jesus. But think of this, the Gospel here is recalled, it's remembered Keep in mind that by the time the Apostle John writes these words down, several years have passed since Jesus was crucified, buried, raised, and ascended. Several years have passed. And this is why, as he's retelling the story, he can insert right here that, that when Jesus was raised from the dead, we remembered this moment. Remember in the introduction when I said you can have a, an event that's magnanimous but you don't get it in the moment but then later on you go, wow, that was big? That's what's happening here. Some three years after this temple cleansing, when Jesus is resurrected from the dead, His disciples saw fulfillment in Him. His words are to be believed even as the Scriptures are to be believed. Why? Because you can't separate the two. The Gospel, in simple terms, is the good news of God about the sinless life of Jesus, the sacrificial death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, and the return of Jesus. Jesus is the good news, by the way. He is the Gospel. But then there are more complex realities about the Gospel. The Gospel is also very bad news for people who do not believe it. Whereas the Gospel is good news for those who repent of their sins, trusting Jesus alone to save them. Hallelujah! There isn't better news. But for those who do not believe, those who will not turn for their, from their sins and turn to Christ in faith, that very good news becomes a death sentence. You will be under the wrath of Almighty God forever and ever. You say, wow, that took a turn. Friend, I wouldn't be a faithful preacher if I made the gospel sound like some ethereal little fuzzy thing where everybody gets to go to heaven because that simply isn't the truth. A sinner will not see his or her need for Jesus until God opens their eyes using His holy standard. But when that happens and they are crushed and they realize, God, I am unable to save myself. I am calling on You. God, I'm resting in You and Your mercy, and God saves. The Gospel is very simple, but it's also very complex. Just know that. But Jesus is giving the Gospel that destroy this temple, kill me, I will die at Your hands. I will raise it up. I'll come back from the dead. That's the Gospel. So the application point for this third thing is think on Jesus fulfilling what He said He would do. He shows us another glimpse into His omniscience or that He knows everything which points to the fact that He's God. Believe Jesus even as those disciples did the eyewitnesses of Him. But for my family in Jesus, I want you to think about Jesus' fulfillment, at least in this way. You say that you are convinced that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person who really lived and really died, was really buried, and really rose from the dead, right? You believe that. If you're a Christian, you have to. You also believe that He ascended back into heaven, but He made a promise to do what? To return. Don't stop believing His promise now. 
People say, look at the world and how bad it is. Friend, the world is in God's grip. And yes, things are bad. But not one molecule is beyond the bounds of God's sovereignty. And I'm borrowing that from Sproul. Fellow believers, you can trust His promise to return just as much as you can trust His promise to save. So trust in Christ. Keep trusting. But unbeliever, you need to think about that too because He did come out of that tomb alive and well. And He said He's coming back. And He'll take His people home, but He will judge those who are not His. You need to consider that. In closing, to my family in Jesus, let us again think on Jesus' great love for God the Father. His concern that the Father would be properly worshipped and honored. His anger was not a display of losing it on people, but rather a necessary act to display that God the Father is always worthy of right worship. See that in Jesus, and, and pray this simple prayer to the Lord Jesus. Lord, give me a love for, for the, you and the Father and the Spirit like you have. Lord, give me that kind of love for you. I won't have it on my own. I'm not strong enough. I never will be. God, I love so many things and so many people. In fact, even good things that have become idols. And by the way, a spouse can be an idol. A child can be an idol. Anyone or anything can become an idol. Anyone or anything that has your love and affections and allegiance more than Jesus, that's an idol. So let's just pray that simple prayer. God, give me a love for you like we see in Jesus. And then worship Him accordingly. Unbeliever, you need to understand that the people who confronted John the Baptist and the people who confronted Jesus, I'm referring to that event in chapter 1 and now this event in chapter 2, these were not passive, irreligious people. These were very religious people. And yet they did not understand that which was necessary to know God. With all of their religious piety and all of their studies, when the gospel was standing right in front of them, they missed it. Hear me clearly. It is of eternal importance that you understand what Jesus claimed about himself and what he backed up by dying and raising from the dead. He is coming again. You need to repent and believe Him or you will know the wrath of God but never the mercy of God. Let's pray. Father, help us to take this in from this section in John. What a moment where Jesus displays His great love for you and His great anger and sorrow at the sin of the Jewish people there at the temple that day. Thank you for the honesty of John the Apostle of how he says they didn't get it at the moment, but later on they did. Lord, sometimes we're not very quick in our thinking and our understanding, so I ask quickness. Lord, help us Grow us not only in the knowledge of You and Your Word, but in the love for You and Your Word. Lord, I pray for my family in Christ that we will treat that which You call sacred as sacred, and it will be because we love You, not because we're trying to perform for You. And help us to rejoice because the Gospel is true. And I pray for the unbeliever that they will see, finally, their need for Christ, and they will turn from their sins and believe Him to save, knowing from the Scriptures that He is the one and the only one who does save. Amen.